Okay. So before the break, we were talking about attachment, and this fits perfectly into um, the adult posture. I just want to make sure that if there's anything in the chat there. Um, it was just a comment, okay? We had a question during the break, which I will address when we get into that section of play. But I just want to make sure um, that uh, we're good to go for any comments or questions. Perfect. So in terms of the, the, the you know, the posture, it's, it, and this is where, you know, sometimes, especially if you're a new newer teacher or that you haven't worked before with K4, K5, it, it's, it's to be expected that obviously, you know, we don't have all the answers. There's situations we'll be confronted with where we, we won't be sure how to address it. It's not about having the answers. Sometimes, you know, we need to talk to colleagues. We need to vent. We need to, but it's it's so important in front of the kids. So important that we make it look like as if we've got this. Um, because all their little eyes are towards us as, as um, you know, leading them. And so they, in order for them to grow, they need to feel safe. And yes, attachment's part of it, but also the way in which we position ourselves. Um, and so the term that, that Gordon Neufeld uses is the alpha posture. Alpha basically means not just taking the lead and being confident, but there's also that side of taking care of, being responsible for, being the nurturer, being grounded ourselves, uh, you know, not um, not being too reactive to, to situations. And it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, I mean, as you mentioned before, Connie, you know, you've, you've got a, a room full of little ones that don't have their fully developed brains and, and, and it's quite triggering. Right, it pushes our buttons, and and we're with them, you know, every day, well, almost every day, five days a week, all day, um, and so we're probably more with 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 kids than their parents themselves. If you think about it, the number of hours that you're with the student, the children, you're with them longer than their own parents are, um, and so you know, we 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 need to take care of ourselves too. The importance of adult mental health making sure that we have support, making sure that we're self-aware of our own stress levels, um, working as a team. Um, you know, I, I've been more and more listening to material on the importance of what um, is called the community of co-caring. So it's not just about each adult taking care of themselves, but how the adults can help support each other, working as a team, um, you know, talking about these things that trigger us, um, to normalize, to make room for that. Um, and it, it, we need to be so careful that we don't do this in front of the kids. Sometimes we get upset and we're, we're with a colleague and, and we'll, it's, it'll slip out. You know, we'll say something about, his, about a child, you know, and they're not too far or, or, or they've, you know, other kids have heard. They need to see us as the person who's got this, even if we don't. And, and so important that we stay calm and grounded as best as we can, but you can only stay calm and grounded if you're taking care of yourself on the flip side. Um, and, and so it because if not, it just becomes a chicken in the egg, right? Where, where where we get exhausted and then we react. So they react to our reaction. They get more difficult to manage. We get more tired. Actually, the other piece I should mention too that's so important is it's not just that we keep ourselves grounded. But we need to be so strategic in the timing in which we address things. We oftentimes wait when things have escalated before we address things. Kids are upset and it's when they're upset that we address it. We need to put structures and, and measures in place in prevention. Setting up, I have I have two slides that I skipped that maybe I shouldn't have skipped because we're, we're lacking a bit of time here, but the importance of setting up the right conditions, part of setting up the right conditions is to be intentional in the way that we set things up, in the structure, in the routine, that we're, prevent, that we're preventative. If we know the same child reacts at recess, maybe we need to rethink. We need to rethink how we how how recess is set up for that child. Maybe they need to do it in a smaller group. Maybe they need to have pockets of time where they're with the adults instead of the kids because they cannot manage being only with the kids, the whole group of kids all the time, thinking about their basic needs. Um, but it, it, so all of this comes hand in hand with with our posture. We can only have the right posture if we ourselves are in that right place. Um, but so if we can be in that right place and have the right conditions for us to have the right posture, being mindful of the way in which we display ourselves in our body language, 
being neutral, being be having a gentle, you know, facial expression, being careful in our stance. Sometimes, you know, we'll have our arms crossed or we'll have our hands on our hips. And, and this gives message to the kids that we're upset with them or that we are not happy with the situation or disappointed with them. Sometimes we talk too much. We talk too loudly. We talk too fast. All of that can impact. And so being mindful of our nonverbals. Um, be, you know, if there's a situation that's not going the way that we expect it to go, sometimes the best strategy is to back away. Rather than trying harder, pushing harder, trying to get it to work, sometimes the best strategy is to, is to take a step back. Maybe getting another adult, you know, if they're around to be able to step in. Maybe, maybe say to the child that you have something else you need to attend to as an excuse to step away. Because if not, if we're reactive, chances are we're going we're gonna to rely on controlling the situation, moving towards more discipline, you know, conventional discipline, upping the ante. We do this when we ourselves are triggered. And so we need to be mindful of, of where we're at. We need to tell ourselves that it's going to happen, that your plan for the day is not going to work out the way you planned it. Not going to. It's just not gonna. Every day, there's gonna be things that will surprise you. That even if you had the, you know, the plan for the day, it was all set up. You had all the activities. You thought of, you know, being inclusive and flexible. Something will happen that will set you off your course. We need to anticipate that and adjust accordingly. Make it look like as if this is what we had planned all along. It's called bluffing. We do our best work as an alpha when we're bluffing our way through situations, not because we want to be disgenuine with the kids. It's because we want to safe keep them from our own distress, because if they have a, a wind of us being distressed by them, not only are they going to feel insecure, but they're going to react and it's just going to become this snowball effect. And, and so, so important that we are attuned to ourselves and that we we we'll rely on the on the power of the teamwork um taking care of ourselves together that community of co-caring and and when a child is dysregulated it's not about controlling a child who's out of control it's about relying on the circumstances the environment the structure the routine our colleagues um you know changing up the circumstances rather than trying to manage the child that's out of control, co-regulating with them. They cannot self-regulate. Let's co-regulate with them. All of that makes a difference in terms of our posture. Just an imagery, you know, to kind of, sometimes an image has, has a thousand words that, that when the adult is regulated or dysregulated, it changes the dynamic. So when the adult is regulated and the child is dysregulated, this will help bring to regulation, but the opposite's not true. If the child is regulated and we're dysregulated, chances are we're going to trigger the child and both of us will now become dysregulated. So important that we keep, and of course, if we're both dysregulated, nobody's helping anybody. And so if we are not in a good place, who else can step in? Can we take a step back, especially those that are two in the classroom, work together as a team it's okay to you know if you, if we have a child who's completely out of control are there other people in the building uh, support staff or whatnot that can help out to be able to to you know manage that situation because no single adult is meant to work with a situation like this by themselves all day long every day no single adult the, the, you know, even if you're the most qualified master teacher, it, it is a, a recipe for burnout for any of us. And so how can we work together and, uh, you know, as a team and to be able to support each other? Um, I'm going to move into emotional development. It, two of the themes that we're covering today is emotional development and social development. A and what is emotional development? What is social development? How do we go about doing this with four or five year olds? Never mind, you know, elementary is, is not an easy task. You know, with a four or five year old, how do we do this? First of all, I want to explain how emotions develop. I think it's important for us to talk about this because you cannot understand emotional development accompaniment if you don't understand how emotions develop on their own. So. First of all, emotions develop over time. Um, like the, like our, our, our overall development, emotion development takes time. There are steps to emotional development. Uh, here are my steps to emotional development. 
in order to be able to reflect and to be able to, to manage our emotions, Gordon Neufeld calls this mixing, we first need to be able to have room to express our emotions, to be able to have find the words to which in which we're feeling. And we also need to feel there's a difference between emotion, emotion and feeling. Feeling is us being aware that our bodies are activated by our emotions. Emotions are chemical. They, they, they happen to us, whether we like it or not, even us as adults, emotions happen to us. And so in order for us to be able to have a relationship with our emotions, we need to first give ourselves permission to express those emotions, find the words of what's happening to us. Is it sadness? Is it anger? What is it that has happening to us to be able to give the, the word, but the right word to be able to match the right word to what it is that's happening to us. But most important, are, do we have permission to feel those emotions? Because you could have an emotion that pushes you around. You could be frustrated and acting out in aggression because you're frustrated. But are you feeling your frustration? Are you able to have a rapport with that emotion? Because if you don't have a rapport, if you're not aware of that emotion happening to you, there's no place for us to be able to temper and reflect on emotions that we do not feel. And so, you know, a lot of what you're going to be doing with your four or five year olds is not reflecting on emotions. It's not managing emotions. We're starting from the beginning. We're trying to set up the conditions for them to feel safe enough to have their emotions, to feel those emotions, to find the words. This is what we are doing with four or five year olds. We're starting from the beginning. So if I go back to my to my original slide here, it's about getting to know ourselves, getting to know how our body feels, not just in terms of emotion, but in terms of senses in our bodies. Do we recognize the different bodily sensations? What I'm scared what do I feel in my tummy when I'm scared, when I'm mad? What happens to my hands when I'm mad? Getting to the basics about how our bodies react to when, when we're feeling certain things. The other piece that's, or, or, that's really important for us as adults that sets the stage for emotion regulation is for us to feel comfort and confidence in working through those emotions. There are so, so many children given the world that they live in outside of our school, that get ambivalent exposure to emotions. They don't feel safe to feel certain emotions. They're not invited in certain emotions. Some kids don't have tears that are invited. Some kids don't get invited in their frustration. There's no room for them to be mad. No room. That's not a, that's not, that's a, a, a bad emotion. That's not invited. And so how can they temper that, that frustration if it's not welcomed. The way that 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 uh, mixing works, if I go back to that stair there about the, and the, that middle stair is mixing. Mixing the way that it works is to have your initial emotion of frustration, of fear, whatever that is. And in order to manage it, to temper it, it's not to get rid of it. It's to have it and to impose onto it a second thought or emotion that will help neutralize it. We call this mixing. And so courage is not being fearless. We are still afraid, but despite the fear, we find the motivation to get past the fear, and that's what we call courage. Patience is not not being frustrated. Patience is being frustrated and adding on the care to not let our impulses of frustration hurt. And that brings patience. We're still frustrated under patience. Our children do not need to not be frustrated. When we're talking about kids getting rid of their aggression, not being aggressive, not hitting, it's not that they shouldn't hit. What the, the way through is for them to find their patience. So they may have the impulse to hit, but they may have the care that they don't want to hit Johnny because they don't want to hurt them physically or hurt their feelings. And so the slowing down of the hitting comes from the second thought or feeling of, 
I'm really mad with you right now and I really feel like hitting you, but I'm not gonna hit you because I care too much for you to hit you. Do you guys see where I'm going? It's not about getting the child to feel ashamed of the hitting. It's how can we get them past the hitting? How can we help them build a relationship with hitting? I remember when my when my daughter was four or five years old, I used to have this conversation with her because she was the type to hit. When she was mad, she'd hit me. And, and instead of telling her don't hit, I used to say to her, Audrey, I, I know that that, you know, when you hit me, that's not what you want to do. I know that after you've hit me, you feel bad that you've hit me. But I also know that when you're really mad with me, your hand does something you don't want it to do. It hits. And so I, I say to her also, you know, when I was your age, I also used to hit when I was mad. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter. But I used to say that to her that when I, you know, that when I was mad, I really would want to hit as well. However, I was able to tell my hand that there's other things I could do than hit. And so I had a relationship with my hand. I was able in my head to be able to talk myself through hitting and doing something else. So instead of hurting, hitting my friend, I would, I don't know, rip paper or I would go running to be able to let out my, my, my frustration. And so I would tell her that I had faith in her. I saw her good intentions. I knew that she couldn't help herself. She wasn't doing this on purpose to be to hurt me. She just couldn't better in that moment because she was so mad with me. We need to have these conversations with our kids about the fact that we understand the impulse, but we also see our good intentions and we see that they cannot better in that moment. And we give them hope that one day they will be able to have a relationship with their mad and that maybe even though they're mad, they'll find other ways to release the mad than hitting. This is so not the conversation that we have with kids. You know, all of these programs on, on self-regulation, zones of regulation, or what, you know, is, is Muzum or whatever the, the castle programs, all these programs talk about getting rid of the impulse. Let's not hit. Instead of hitting, let's do this. And it's true, eventually we want to replace the hitting with something else, but can we first honor the impulse of when I'm mad, what I want to do is hit. Or a kid, another kid could be a different thing. They want to kick or they want to bite or they want to swear at them or whatever it is. Not that we're giving it, it's not that we are congratulating them on their impulses. Of course, the impulse is not the right way to go about it, but the emotion underneath it has a purpose. It is there for a reason. Can we make room for the frustration? By the way, frustration is actually a good thing. If we were never frustrated, we would not be effects of, we would not be agents of change. Being frustrated is what allows us to be determined to plow through a situation that has obstacles. We need frustration in our lives to be good change agents of change. The issue is not the frustration. The issue is that our frustration turns foul and it leads to aggression. And so if the child is embarrassed of having that impulse, even if it's just in their head, they have nothing to work with this forward. And so we need to give permission to the emotions and give them the words. How do they feel in their bodies when they're mad? What's happening to them? How could we help them channel that energy? So rather than waiting for them to be mad to channel the energy, how about if we channel the energy when they're not mad in a preventative mode? So this is when we get into all of these, what we call emotional release activities, where we can play out through, through it could be through play, but it could also be through different activities, going outside, running, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, push, you know, pull, throwing a ball against the wall. You know, the, the motion of punching somebody, being able to throw something against the target, a ball, or, uh, or you know, playing, I don't know if any of your schools have a ballon poire, to be able to play with that ball. These are similar motions to be able to let out some of that frustration. We need to do this preventatively. Instead of a child being afraid, rather than saying, don't be scared, we can say to the child, oh my goodness, I so understand that you're afraid. How about if I help you to find your courage? Again, another example with my daughter, you know, she was the, the, so afraid of doing the high slide 
because she had the fear of heights and it was difficult for her to go to that top stair. Once she was going down the slide, she was really excited. It was it was climbing the steps that she was really afraid of to you know be at the top of there and to watch down. And so she wanted me to do it with her. So rather than me say, embarrassing her to say, come on, it's such a small slide, just go and do it. I, I would say to her, oh my goodness, I, I remember when I was your age, me too, I was afraid of sliding. How about if I do it with you so I could help you find your courage? And, and, and you know, at some point she found more fun, even though she was afraid of going up, the, her, her pleasure of going down the slide helped her through the fear of climbing up the steps. So the, the, the pleasure trumped the fear. Again, another example, I remember when she was six or seven years old, she wanted to get her ears pierced and she couldn't muster up the, the, the courage to get her ears pierced. She wanted it, but she couldn't. And, and we tried three or four times to go to the parlor to get her ears pierced. And as we got closer to the situation, she would she would want to leave. And so I wouldn't shame her and saying, it's nothing, just do it and let's finish with it. I honored the fear and we left. I mean, obviously it was frustrating for me to have to go there three, four times. But one day she was able to trump her fear because her desire to have the earrings were stronger than her fears to get the ears pierced. And I also helped her to, to hold her hand. So holding her hand, being there with her, helped her to find her courage. And so we need to start thinking of emotions this way. It's not about teaching we're too quick at things. We're trying to teach them too fast, the flip side of things. We need to walk it through step by step with them and to help them find those emotions to be able to neutralize the fear and the frustration and make room for sadness. You know, we're so sanitized in our society about, about you know, strength, about resilience. What, what does resilience look like is for us to be to be strong, to be tough actually having tears is resiliency. It's not weakness. There's nothing wrong with us having tears. This is what allows for us to be able to bounce back from adversity to find our tears. You know, how can we try to counter some of the message that these children are getting from their homes and from society uh, around all of these different things? We don't make enough room for these different emotions. We're, we're too quick at, at getting them to the other side of things. Um, and, and so, um, wait, I want to, I want to get to, sorry, I want to get to, to this here in terms of emotional development practices. How do we do this? First of all, a lot of it has to do, uh, with putting things into context. Children learn in relationship, in context. And so it, it, again, it's important that we share with our, our children that we are with in the classroom, our own stories of our own emotions. How do we get through our own emotions? How do our children, and if we don't want to talk about us, maybe talk about our kids or other kids that we've had, you know, and their experiences of emotions. How about stories? There's so many beautiful stories on emotions, talking about characters and storybooks, using games or on emotions, using photographs, you know, we have tendency of using, um, what's it called, um, pictograms. We use pictograms for emotions. We actually need to use real faces, real facial expressions. Children will not recognize emotions on, on pictograms. Using a mirror, showing it on our own faces. And so getting back to the basics about things using different mediums to be able to play out emotions without words. Emotions are not just with words. Emotions can be played out without words, through art, through music, through dance, through puppets, through dress up, through the imagination, through play. All of these mediums can be ways for children to experience emotions without necessarily talking about emotions. Some children will not open up about their own experience, their own emotions. They don't use words of their own. So can we get them to experience it through someone else, something else, through a story, ex getting them exposed to that? Um, for those who have heard of the book Reclaiming Our Students, Hannah Beach wrote a book called Reclaiming Our Students. She also created a handbook called the Inside Out Handbook. And in her handbook, she uses activities for children to experience emotions through channeling it through uh, arts through through dance, through music, through movement. Um, I have here 
on in one of my slides um, the um, link to the website to go and download the Inside Out Handbook. The password is experience. And you can get the 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 or, or you know you could get the handbook this way. She also has a few editorials on her website that you can download. That um, it's four examples of of within her Inside Out handbooks on these activities. She will tailor them to older and to younger students, and so she'll she'll give an example of an activity, and then she'll she'll give examples of how to tweak it for your younger population or older population. So I invite you to go and take a look at that. You can use, there's so many beautiful stories uh, around emotions. I've got a whole page full of, of examples of books. My colleague Lucie Brisebois at Riverside put together padlets where she has examples of books in English and in French with activities around emotions, uh, around expressive activities that, uh, that link to emotions to outdoor activities, being physical and relating it to releasing stress and emotions through physical activities. I invite you to go and download all of these different uh, padlets and there's tons and tons of examples of activities. I also have a, a webinar, not a webinar, excuse me, a, a capsule, video capsule that we did on play drama dress up. So to be able to use that um, this this image here of faces can be downloaded for free off of the CBM website. So I invite you to go and take a look at that. Um, and so uh, I was talking about releasing emotions through um, different activities, discovering bodily sensations, doing a silhouette, you know, you know, kind of like you've got those cookie cutter silhouettes there and kids get the color in the silhouette, how they're feeling in different parts of their bodies using de different sensory materials for them to touch different textures and to describe the texture to how they're feeling in their bodies. That could be a way you know, to do that. Um, they also need with us to do it with them through the environment, through the senses, to get them to experience what does it feel like to feel calm? Some kids never feel calm, never feel comfort. How could we help them actually not just say to calm down, to, to help them experience it. What does that look like to be calm? What does that look like to feel comfortable through the playing soft music, dimming the lights, having these really cozy, comfy textures through um, different sensory materials, calming nature pictures, um, even using scents. You know, there's certain scents that help us to calm lavender. There's so many other scents. Going through the senses to help them experience this. You guys could attribute a day a week to this where we walk through the different senses and we, we get to experience and describe what does that feel and it look like for each of us. The other thing that's so central is if the child is not at rest, they will not be available to develop their emotions. So we need in having the right measures, give them space to play, to move, to have respite, to go outside. These are fundamental needs that need to be there for them to be at rest enough to be available to develop their emotions. Without this, then, then all we're doing is talking about emotions in an intellectualized kind of way. We cannot intellectualize emotions. Emotions are instinctual. They are raw. They are primitive. We need to go at it from the experiential, not from the intellect. We need to move away from talking about emotions in a disconnected way. We need to get them to be in it, to do it with them. It changes everything to do this this way. And, and again, being careful about categor categor categorizing emotions. There's no good and bad emotion. They all have a reason to be there. They have a purpose. And so how can we help children move away from feeling guilty or ashamed of experiencing certain emotions? And we need to focus on emotional regulation beyond just self-regulation. Self-regulation is the last, you remember with the stair, self-regulation and reflection, where's my slide, is, is the top of the stairs. It's not about focusing on self-regulation. Self-regulation will come if we focus on the other steps first. So our focus is expressing, naming, and feeling emotions feeling through safe relationships, through the right environment, naming by giving them the words, but not just giving them the words. We need to model to them, what does the word look like in our bodies? 
when I'm mad, how does that come out in my body? When I'm sad, what does that look like in my body? We need to match the word to the experience because if we just give them words, they'll know all the words. They won't know how to match which word with what experience. And so we need to break that down for them. We don't do this enough. Leave room for co-regulation. Right now, your job is to do co-regulation with them. They're nowhere near self-regulation. It's all about co-regulation. And of course, and play, 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 and more play. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. And that's why when we talk about feelings and we talk about vocabulary, for example, which obviously we'll be looking at the language development later. But when we talk about that, uh, example, in the month of October, maybe a lot of you did Halloween themes and we talked about the dark and the words that come out that are more that are really important. Those are the ones we want to focus on, for example, like fear, like afraid, the dark. Learning about fear and being able to express fear and the in the dark is more important at a four and five year old level than really learning the vocabulary word witch and boomstick. So we always have to like keep in mind the the um, the audience we're dealing with. So when we're looking at our four and five year olds, and when you're also practicing that vocabulary piece in your let's say literacy center, those are the words that we want to practice. We're not just yes, we're exposing them to the words like witch. But in the yeah. month of October, that's a really good time to also be addressing fear. And, you know, so it's yeah. really the words. Um... Mm -hmm. There was a comment in the chat that I, I want to address. Uh, and, and the person was saying, coming back to the statement of the influx of, of immigrant students, that there's a tendency to overly pr protect or to overly baby preschool age children in some cultures. How can we address this to prevent learned helplessness while still respecting, as you mentioned prior, this idea that kids will look to be independent on their own? So th th the thing is that there's such a fine line between nurturing and giving what they need in order for them to spontaneously um, it become emergent and to grow. And, and so the word over baby for me, it's not that we're babying them. However, where it becomes this babying, and I don't like the word babying, but, but, but it's it's when we, without meaning to, will will display a stress or an anxiety around the, the, the parenting or, or upbringing or kids and, and it's not about doing it with them or for them that is the issue, is that the, it's the energy in which the adult are feeling unsafe or insecure or stressed or anxious, and the kids are picking up on that energy and they're reacting to that. And so this learned helplessness that you're talking about mostly happens not because we are we are honoring dependence. When we're honoring dependence, but we're also celebrating emergence, kids will spontaneously want to go out and venture forth. But if they feel that the adults are insecure, then they will not venture forth because they're, they're, they're mirroring the adult's energy. So it's not about what we do, it's how we come across to the child in our energy. So if the parents are feeling confident, and even if they are doing it with the child or for the child until the child can feel fulfilled, this learned helplessness will not happen because spontaneously they will want to do. Remember that attachment also serves, also serves development. So if you think about the way attachment is done, the second level of attachment is sameness. Kids will want to copy the adults. And so if the adults are doing it with the child or for the child, the child will want to copy the adult and now do it themselves. They will want to do it like the adults. And so, but they can only do this if they're feeling safe in their environment and their attachment. And so these kids that are, that seem to have this learned helplessness, I don't think the issue is the fact that the adults are doing it with them or for them. I think the issue is the is the energy or the way in which it's being done. So if we can convey confidence, if we can convey that we believe in the child, that we're excited for when they're trying things on their own, and that we're not over imposing onto them our own fears and insecurities, then they will spontaneously move forward in their own growth and development. Does that make sense? Catherine, that's amazing. Thank you for clarifying that. That's yeah, really, because sometimes we really get caught well in the said. what 
it's not the what it's the it's the context yeah it changes everything and the way in which we do it mirroring the adult's energy i really love that yeah thank you for saying that yeah yeah, you know, I was listening to that 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 um, child psychol psychiatrist I, I mentioned earlier today, Céline Lamy. One of the things that she's noticed is that the adults no longer take the time nowadays to stay present in the moment with children, and and, and to it's a two way street. Like both people kind of uh, um, gain from this where not only does the child feel important in that dynamic, but th there, there's something that happens in, when adults slow down and stay in the moment with the child and observe the child and, and they, they nurture that dynamic. Yes, the adults gain something from this where they get to really see where the child's at and where their needs are, where their struggles are and so forth, because we're staying in the moment. But the child also gains from that where it fulfills their basic needs and spontaneously they will want to move forward from that situation and grow. And, and I think that sadly, because of all of the digital devices, one piece of the digital devices where parents don't take time anymore to stay in the moment with their kids, so kids don't, don't get fulfilled in that way. But also, I feel like we're in a society nowadays where parents, adults have lost their intuition in, of parenting. We are turning towards experts to teach us how to parent. And so parents are lost. And this insecurity that parents have about upbringing their kids, and they think that they need to have the, to know the, 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 the right way to do it, that has messed with our parenting intuition. And parents have lost their confidence and I think that that's the other piece that is completely messing with with development because kids are sensing our insecurities. And, and and you know what? It's not just parenting. I think that it's the same thing in education. I, I, I because education is an extension of parenting. It's still upbringing kids. Yes, there's a teaching component to it, but the whole element of upbringing kids is supposed to come from our intuition. And we're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to do it as a village. You know that th there's there's a there's research that has shown that a child grows well in a village of a minimum four adults at all times. Look at the ratio that we've set up in our classroom. It's not what four adults for one child. It's one adult for how many kids? We've we've Too lost many. we we've we've yeah. lost that intuition. Every child should have a minimum of four adults in their lives to properly upbring them. And so, you know, we're, we're not in the right conditions to be able to do this properly. And so, of course, adults are fatigued, they're exhausted, they're discouraged, they're feeling powerless. The ratio is not adequate for what, for what it's supposed to be. And so what do we do when we're tired, when we're, when we're feeling powerless? We turn, we turn for answers. We turn to recipes. We turn to strategies. We turn to, 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 to I, I call them gimmicks. We need to get back to basics. We need to get back to our intuition. We need to get back to uh, having the right conditions to help them to unfold properly. It's a, anyway, I, I, thank I, you, know. you so much for saying that. Yeah. And that's yeah. why this, um, this whole piece, you know, I know you had uh, started preparing it last year and then you've done so many changes to it. And that's why for myself and our team, at the school board, it's super important that whole, uh, you know, that that piece, that brain development piece, and understanding um, early childhood development. Because without the knowledge and the yeah. true understanding for brain development, we can't really understand how to if we don't understand really what's going on. Exactly, exactly. There's another question I'll answer in the chat, but I'll, I'll answer it after I cover this section on social development. So again, similarly to to emotion. Social development is something that unfolds over time. And, and there, there's actually prere prerequisites, excuse me, to develop social development. You cannot learn to interact with others if you have not yet developed your own sense of self. The sense of self is the first step. And so once you're able to hold on to yourself and not fuse to others, and that and that you understand your own limits and boundaries and other people's limits and boundaries social development cannot happen without that happening first and so it's not about 
um, pushing for social skills. It's about setting the stage for social development to unfold naturally. And so how do we go about doing this? Um, you know, uh, helping kids mix well with each other without losing the, their sense of self. And so first of all, can we can we have opportunities with our four or five year olds to define the sense of self? Do they even know who they are? What do they, what do I like? What do I feel? What hurts my feelings? What are my triggers? What are my boundaries? Helping children to develop that sense of self. Uh, and to mix with others without losing themselves. Part of it is developmental. You guys will not be able to imp to teach. It's not something you teach. It's something you expose children with. And as they will mature, this will fall into place. But you can still plant the seed. We can still expose them to these things. Um, and so part of the... Oh, and before I forget, there, there's the saying from Ross Green. Ross Green wrote, The Explosive Child. And he says that children do well when they can. So it's not that they that that they do well, you know, when we tell them to, it's when they can. So when a child doesn't consistently comply with what we ask of them, we must understand that the child is probably not making a deliberate choice to misbehave, but rather adapting to an immature social emotional system that is trying to cope. When adults react to a problematic behavior by uh, issuing consequences for the child's poor choices, they assume the child can choose to behave otherwise. However, this requires executive functioning capacity um, and many vulnerable children and teens, not just children and even young adults, require years to ex of experience to acquire this. Social emotional development cannot be taught per se but rather grown and cultivated. Children must first experience it through caring, attuned relationships with adults. If vulnerable children haven't experienced that warmth through co-regulation, our efforts to teach them self-regulation will inevitably fall short. So in terms of, of social development, can we, in through play, 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 my goodness, both emotional and social development, can we use play to introduce, model, and prompt what are the adult expectations um, through stories, through chants, through role playing, through uh, and so forth, using stories where characters are, um, you know, playing out different social situations, exploring those ranges of social situations through stories, using games to be able to practice a different range of social situations. Legos can be a way to use it. Puppets can be a way through math, through role playing. And it's important for the adult to be the narrator of not just what is expected, but but what is it, you know, in terms of our expectations, what is that we want them to do and not do? So like, what is, like when we're talking about having a positive classroom environment, what does that look like really, concretely? You know, if we want children to, I don't know, listen to a story, narrating, scripting, what does that look like to listen to a story and giving variants that are inclusive, of course, to, you know, for, for, because not all children can do it the exact same way. It can't be cookie cutter. We have to give a range. But we need to show to them, you know, if they're going to be using, I don't know, a ball, how do we use the ball? What's the appropriate use of the ball and what should we not do with the ball? So not just what we should do, but should not do. Like we need to really walk through this. The, the biggest issues that we have in school, I find in general, is the schoolyard. The schoolyard much more than the classroom. Part of the reason why the schoolyard's a problem is because kids don't know how to play. We need to show to them how do we play? How do we use certain certain um, equipment, certain balls, certain you know sleds in the winter? How do we, if we're gonna play a certain game, how do we play that game? What are the rules of the game? What are the parameters around the game? Th th these are all things that, because, you know, nowadays kids are on screens at home. They don't get to play these games at home with their parents or with their siblings. They're on screens. And so we need to teach all over again all of these different games. It could be a perfect idea to get an older student in the building. I remember when my daughter started kindergarten, they at her school, they used to use grade five and grade six students to uh, mod introduce and model and accompany children in playing games. 
it was amazing what they would do. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we don't have enough adults to be able to go around. How, why not use older students to be able to do this? Um, and, and of course, you know, similarly to emotions, we need to put in place the right environments for them to be successful. Because if they're tired, if they're stressed, if they're overstimulated, they are not available to develop social development. And so being intentional in the way that we set up the physical space, having, you know, the, you know some of it, I'm, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but <clears throat> having the right posture as an adult, being consistent and predictable in the structures and routines, having the adequate supervision, we do not have enough supervision. We do, we do not. We run short in terms of the number of adults that are there and the adults that are there oftentimes are not doing the proper type of supervision making sure they go outside, making sure that we're doing the transitions with them. At four and five years old, they do not do well with transitions. Can we help them break the transition into micro transitions? Getting dressed, for example, instead of just saying to kids, okay, children, get dressed, helping them in the step-by-step, -step, well, what does that look like to get dressed? So breaking it down for them, going beyond just the focus on getting along, it's not social development is much bigger than just getting along, getting to know ourselves and, and so forth, being careful of attributing the, be, the behavior of the child to their person. It's not because they are they are not responding to our expectation that they're a bad kid. They're just not able to do better in that moment. Can we normalize and validate the emotions behind the behavior? So to go back to the example in the chat about a child who a child who hit their classmate for no reason at all, and she was not always mad or frustrated uh, with them, and sometimes she cannot explain why she hurts other people. The, the, the thing is that it's not because we're not seeing the reason in the moment that there isn't a reason. There is always a reason behind a behavior, always. Even if it's not evident in the moment, it is possible that the child has accumulated emotion from another time from the day before from the night from the night before the morning of sometimes children will also displace their emotions they may be mad in the moment but because they do not want to disappoint the alarm will displace the frustration but the frustration has not dissipated the frustration stays in the system and it's and, and it circles until it is released so maybe the child was mad at recess, but they will they did not let out that frustration in that moment. And then they come to class and now the frustration is there waiting to get out. And all of a sudden it comes out in that activity. And so we mustn't tell ourselves that kids do things for no reason. There is always a reason whether we see it or not. And so, you know, if the child cannot explain it, it's not because that there, there isn't a true re reason behind. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, our four or five-year-olds have a very hard time verbalizing not only their emotions, but why they're doing what they're doing. And so, you know, this is where we will go down the rabbit hole. If we start asking ourselves why a child did what they did, and we ask them why, and then we get into who started it, who continued it? Who finished it? Who's at fault? How do we, you know, who's going to say sorry to who? We're getting caught up in these very sophisticated and um, uh, mature elements that they're not yet ready for. We're, 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 we're doing things that is not developmentally appropriate if we're focusing on that and we're going down a rabbit hole. Honestly, the focus is making sure the other child who got hit has been addressed that they're feeling taken care of and safe by the adult, that we've separated the children, that we're able to say to the child who hit, oh my goodness, you know, I, 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 even if they don't know why, they have frustration in them. Can we talk about the frustration? Of course, we're not gonna congratulate them that they hit the other kid, but at the same time, we could say to that child, you know, when we're really, really mad, sometimes we do things that we don't mean to do, and sometimes we, you know, we'll feel bad about that. And so we don't focus necessarily on the apology, but we could focus, on if, especially if the child doesn't feel sorry, the worst thing we could be doing is forcing apologies. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the book called The Sorry Plane. 
the book, the story plane is about the child finding their stories. And so if the child is feeling sorry, then that's fine if they're apologizing, but we shouldn't be making kids apologize. We should focus on the repair. And once the child can find their stories, then they could apologize. But at the minimum, what we could be doing in the meantime is at least for that child to acknowledge that their that, that their actions have created a, a, you know hurt in the other child. There's a difference between acknowledging and apologizing. Apologizing means that we're feeling sorry. We could still acknowledge that the other child was hurt. But if we're not feeling sorry, at the minimum, we could acknowledge the other child was hurt. Um, you know, we get again, this is another rabbit hole where we get caught up with forcing kids to apologize. And then the, the, the sad thing about that is that kids will strategically apologize and not truly feel sorry. It becomes these these, these un, unsincere apologies. And so how can we help them find their stories rather than forcing something that's just not there just yet? I think that I've, I've created some some stir there in the group that there's some some chat. Let me see if there's anything else that I could be saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, about the fact that they don't know how to play. So how can we how can we set that stage for that? Uh, workshops for parents with with practical strategies for supporting the development uh, uh, of their children is important. Absolutely. You know, I'm doing this with you guys today, but uh, but, you know, it's so important that we're able to help parents get back to their intuition to understand how development works, to get back to the basics about attachment, about posture, about play, about emotions you know, rather than, than than trying to take a tangent on other things. I completely agree. And that's where you could use that K4 valet parent, parent component uh, money to, to absolutely hire uh, speakers to come in to give workshops for parents. That's what it's, um, yeah. that's what you can absolutely use it for. Exactly, exactly. So our role in the meantime, until they can be mature enough to handle social interactions, we need to be their prefrontal cortex for them. We need to accept the responsibility for their immature brains in a context that they cannot handle. So that means putting in place the proper structures and routines for them to be more successful. It's not a good idea to put four or five-year-olds together as a whole group outside in an unstructured play. They are not successful in that type of environment. We're better off setting up stations. Somebody talked about stations earlier. Even in the classroom, I think it's a good idea for kids to play with each other in smaller groups rather than doing it with the whole class. And, and the same thing outside, can we structure things? Can we practice these structures and routines? The first months of, out of the school year should be about introducing the structures and routines and practicing, practicing, practicing. It, we should not from year to year expect that because we've said it once or twice that it's enough. Remember, they've got little brains. They're not able to retain all the information. They're not able to access this information. We need to constantly, constantly get back to our root structures and routines and practice them using music, using, you know, songs to be able to help them remember th that routine. You know, th th the most intuitive um, master teachers are the ones that use a lot, a lot of mediums, especially music and, and chants to help the kids remember what they need to do next. Attaching music to those different routines, it really helps. By the way, music hits a different part of the brain. And so if we're just teaching, it only hits one side of the brain. If we're using music, we're using the other side of the brain. So we're helping to increase the probability that the child will be able to retrieve what they've, what, what they, they, you know, have in, um, whatchamacallit, brought into their, their uh, thinking in terms of the structures and routines. Keeping them out of situations that they cannot handle, scripting the appropriate behavior. Let's show them what does that look like to stand in line? What does that look like to sit in a circle? What does that look like to get ready to go out for recess? We need to walk it through step by step by step and, and doing it through play because if we're constantly telling them what they should be doing when, 
we will have resistance and opposition if we are telling them we need to make it fun and engaging and showing them and we do it with them. The more that we make it fun, the more they will be engaged, the more they will want to do it alongside us. Somebody during the break uh, asked me a question about um, playing with peers and, and she, she was wondering about if the child doesn't want to go outside to play with their friends and want to stay indoors with us, are we depriving them of play? And so I want to say there's a difference between exposing a child to play and a child socializing. At that young age, the most important person in their lives are the adults. The children are not a good role model to be able to pass down appropriate emotional and social development. They need to be oriented towards us, the adults. The more they are with us and not with each other, the better, especially at the beginning of the year. And so if that child wants to stay with the adult, I'm not saying they should never be with their peers, but maybe we could organize a smaller group of, of children where they have one other child or two other children along with the adult and that they, then they can do something that is you know easier for them. Some kids are very introverted, very shy. It's difficult for them to be with the whole group, especially in unstructured times. And so we want to make sure that um, they get some of that exposure, but at the same time that it's done with us. Um, the other thing too is that is that play is not socializing and socializing is not play. Play, and, and that's exactly where I'm getting into now, what is play? Play is a spontaneous activity that cannot be taught or commanded. It, true play is something that is done in the imaginary. It's not for real. There's not true repercussions. There's not true consequences to play. There's the second that a child is playing a board game or playing a sport where somebody's winning and losing, this is not considered true play. True play is when there is no result to be had, no, no goal, that there is no pressure, no repercussions. It is done not for real, not for work. They're, the children are free to do as they wish. They're engaged in it. They're feeling safe in it. They are expressive in it. It's coming from them out. Not that they are that they're not being passive. You know, like, like for example, a screen screen is not play. Playing video games is not true play. Watching, a, you know, a, a, a show is not play. It has to be something that is coming from inside out, not from outside in. The second that we start commenting on their play, and that we're saying, oh, how nice you're doing this or, oh, no, you know, maybe you could be doing it like that. We've just messed with their play. We should not be commenting on their play. It's not for real. There shouldn't be there shouldn't be consequences and repercussions to play. If play is done properly, it has so many beautiful benefits. It is there to help the brain grow. It is there to help emotions develop and for us to have emotional well-being. There has been studies that have shown that there is a direct link between the loss of play and mental health issues. Direct link. And play helps to increase good attachments. And so through play, this helps children make sense of their world. It helps them build the brain through the experiences. It's not the lessons that help the brain grow. It's the experiences that uh, it, it allows children to work through their emotions. And when play is interrupted, emotional well-being and brain development are affected. Studies have shown that self-regulation skills were better in those children who were allowed to play without interruption. And so talking about, about emotional development, if we let our kids play without interruption, that is a direct link to help emotions grow and develop. When children are engaged in a play activity that uh, they uh, stay selectively focused on the situation at, pr at the present time, they tune out the distractions and they hold information in their heads. So not only does play help with mental health and so forth, but it actually gives us the elements that we need to learn. So, you know, for, to learn, we need to be able to stay focused. We need to be able to tune out distractions, to be able to hold information in our heads. This begins through play. Uh, so uh, this then allows for children to develop the capacity to reflect, to look, to listen, to feel before acting on primary, uh, primarily emotions that urge. 
And so again, these are all attributes that we want our, our children to eventually gain as students, as successful students. This comes through play. Studies have also shown that ADHD seems to be related to the deficits in playtime. There's a, a, a um, researcher called uh, Jack Panksepp. Jack Panksepp put a lot of time, he's passed now, but he's put a lot of time into understanding the benefits of play and, and the impact of the deficits of play. And not only has he he's shown through research with rats that um, the lack of play makes that the rats are more um, dysregulated, more stressed and less attentive, but he's also seen the opposite effect, that the more that we will give the rats the opportunity to play, play fight and so forth, so forth, the more the benefits will will um, remove all of the symptoms that are related to ADHD type behavior. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but there's more and more children in K4, K5, especially K5, of course, because K4 is more newer, you know, in terms of the, the commonality of the quantity of classrooms. There's more and more kids being diagnosed with ADHD in kindergarten and are given medication. I, I personally think that it's part it's related in part uh, not just with um, anxiety, because by the way, anxiety and ADHD have similar symptoms, but also because play has been lost. So uh, the, the other piece this is, is happening in, in yeah. daycares. Um, it starts very, very early on. I've met a lot of parents when we're doing orientations in the spring, their, their children, very young children, are pulled out of the classrooms in the daycares because they're being expected at an earlier and earlier age to sit down and focus. And the um, I liked what you said before. The fact is we don't learn how to focus by focusing. We learn how to focus when we're at play, right? So yeah. we can't yeah. expect uh, the same thing with you know, with, with everything else, this, that's why it's called preschool, right? So we're learning all these skills before we become actual students. So we're, we're setting the stage, we're laying the foundations and it's happening earlier and earlier. So they're arriving at four and five year olds in our classrooms yeah. already having been frustrated for two years prior when they're in a daycare setting, when they're expected to be students already. Yeah. And so they're exactly. so far from that. It's 1137. I'm just uh, giving you. Yeah, I know. Up. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover two last slides and, I'll, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And so, you know, David Elkind and, and Stuart Brown, which are, are two, again, other authors besides Jack Panksepp that have looked at the, the loss of play and the impact. Um, and so oh, he, the David Elkind has said over the past two decades, children have lost 12 hours of free, uh, of free time a week, including eight hours of unstructured play and outdoor activities. Free unstructured play and spontaneous uh, pickup games and self-initiated dramatic play are replaced by digital devices. And so with that, Stuart Brown has said also that outdoor play has decreased by 71% in, in one generation in both the US and the UK, and that we've seen the escalating diagnoses, not just of ADHD, but also of childhood anxiety and depression. And so my goodness, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the loss of play there, um, the last slides that I have at the end, I'm going to you guys can just read them through. I had uh, four or five slides on guidelines for handling conflict between children. Um, we've got a step by step here on, on what can be done. Um, and so ultimately, what I would say to you and, and I'll, I'll end on this is regardless of what happens in the day, there's been an incident. The child has done something and is feeling bad. We need to make it very explicit that no matter what has happened, this is this has not impacted the relationship. This is called bridging. And so saying something to the child like, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow, we'll find a way to make things better um, and so forth. Because if they have wind that our relationship is conditional to their good behavior, this will be the beginning of the end. And so I'm sure you guys have seen this, um, this poster from New Frontiers, I love it. And so this is just a quick kind of, you know, overall of who are our preschoolers and, and unapologetic. Um, and so I hope that this was helpful. This is just a first step. Uh, next time in um, April or March, I will be covering more in depth um, social and emotional development. So in the meantime, I invite you to go and take a look at the website. Uh, we've got tons and tons of resources that are there. Um, and so I will stop sharing. Um, stop sharing. There we go.
Thank you so much, Catherine. That was Yeah, you're welcome. I know I had said that we would do a question at the end, but I've kind of answered as we went. So I hope that I've I've answered to many questions. And um, if you've got any additional ones, Connie, send them through through you to me, and I can always answer additional ones if needed. Absolutely. So for now, we're going to take our lunch break. We're back at 12.30. This afternoon will be uh, Julie LaChapelle. And uh, I will be handing out the feedback form. Uh, feedback form goes um, hand in hand with your attendance, and that will be uh, this afternoon. So it's 12.30, the same link. We'll see you then. Thank you Perfect. very much, oh, Catherine. Thank you so much. Uh, you can stop the recording, uh, Connie. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. I know there were more questions in the chat. Um, you can always send them uh, send them my way, uh, Connie. Okay. Absolutely.